I'll, I'll just um, uh, read the, the description. Um, the pa this panel considers how queer Filipinos engage with issues of embodiment, disability, and health. In the process, it seeks to foreground the experiences of scholars, activists, and frontline community workers with pressing issues re relevant to queer Filipino communities in Canada. This panel engages with the following key questions. How might tensions of embodiment around queer and transgender identity have relevance to uh, Filipino, Filipina lives within Canada? How might notions of disability and illness affect the capacity building of queer Filipinos, Filipinas? How might the need to mitigate queer violence affect Filipino, Filipino lives? And what role does HIV AIDS play in the way that LGBTQ Filipinos, Filipinas understand and navigate their multiple communities? Our first speaker is Constantine Cabarios. Uh, he was born in Paniki, Tarlac, and immigrated to Toronto with his family in 1975. He is a registered social worker and currently works at the Towel Talk Bathhouse, Counselor for AIDS Committee of Toronto, providing brief counseling to a diverse group of gay and bisexual men. As a Filipino-Canadian, Constantine's professional and personal narrative has been shaped by his experience as a newcomer who had to navigate Toronto as a racialized queer man while bearing witness to the effects of HIV AIDS and mental health issues on friends and family. He has over eight years of volunteer and work experience with mental health, immigration and settlement, and HIV AIDS sectors. He serves on the boards of Silayan Filipino Community Center, Asian Community Aid Services, and Community Resource Connections of Toronto, helping develop organizational policies community outreach, and program development initiatives. Please help me welcome Constantine. Sorry, Marissa, the screen is not on. How do you turn on the screen? Thank you, Fritz, for inviting me uh, to this wonderful event. Um, so, yeah, so Marissa already talked about where I work. Um, I work at the AIDS Committee of Toronto, and um, my specific program is called Towel Talk, which is a bathhouse counseling program. And if you can imagine, that's why I have a towel there, and I couldn't find uh, like a bathhouse, so it's a bathtub. Um, just to give you some context, um, it's. Uh, I've been working there for two years now, and um, when I first got hired. Um, I heard ab about anti-oppression, anti-racist uh, frameworks. So when, they, when I got hired, uh, if you can imagine, it's a panel of three white uh, people, and they asked me about, so Constantine, what do you think about anti-oppression? And you know, I was gonna be flippant, and I was gonna, s I was gonna say, well, let's see, you're all white, and you're going to kind of tell me what it's like to be oppressed. So that's the agency um, that uh, I thought I was gonna work at. And um, the AIDS Committee of Toronto is actually a very progressive um, AIDS service organization. Um, in their policies, um, they live and breathe anti-oppression, anti-racist frameworks, even though it's predominantly white. And this is important to note because uh, during the AIDS crisis, um, a lot of our uh, queer brothers and sisters um, and straight allies were infected and affected by HIV AIDS. So we didn't have the language back then to address um, the, the issues that were going on that was driving the infections. So now we do. So to say that I work in a white organization I think is a misnomer. However, um, when I got there, that's what I saw you know, predominantly. So uh, we were talking about uh, our identity as Filipinos. Um, so I made it a point to embed myself in a mainstream organization. I, uh, in my bio, I also s it said that uh, I was on the boards of ACAS, the Asian Community Aid Services, and um, I also worked there. And that's to reclaim my Asian-ness. Um, and this is important as I move along in the slides. Um, because I was born in the Philippines, and so my perspective, I came here in 1975 at age five, 
and I'm now 47. And that's gonna come into play when I talk about my work. All right, so now we're in a bathhouse. So that's uh, bathhouse tiles, if you can't see it. Um, I couldn't find a bathhouse picture and I don't want to infringe on copyright, so that's what you're gonna get. Um, so this is an ad that we had placed um, in Now Magazine and Extra. So just to give you some context, um, Towel Talk was uh, an idea that started in um, Chicago and Berkeley at the uh, Steamworks Bathhouse. They had an intervention program called Mr. Sex. And um, what they identified was bathhouse patrons were talking to bathhouse staff and other bathhouse patrons um, about their problems, whether it's relationship or, and I'm gonna, can I swear? Okay, so I fucked without a condom. Fuck, what am I gonna do? Okay, so staff were inundated with all of these um, complex issues. So what they had done, in, in, actually it was in Chicago, they had placed a, um, an outreach worker there, uh, maybe like uh, three hours. And, um, and that's to, uh, you know, not to, so, so it would prevent them from bugging uh, the workers so that the, the patrons, the other patrons can have sex freely and not be ridden by guilt, okay? So, Five years ago, um, in the Gay Men's Health Sexual Health Summit, uh, there was a presentation by Mr. Sex uh, from Chicago, and um, the AIDS Committee of Toronto, in, in partnership with the other AIDS service organizations, collaborated, did a uh, focus group, and they identified a need here in Toronto, because the same things were happening here in our, at that time, four bathhouses, which is um, Steamworks, um, Spa Access, Central Spa, and St. Mark's, which has since closed. So as you can see in the ad, it's free, confidential, it's professional. Uh, most of our counselors um, have a master's degree in either um, counseling psychology or social work, like myself. Um, it's very discreet, and um, we're there for three hours uh, for a shift, and we have a little room, and I wear a t-shirt, not a towel. Um, because that's you know bordering on a uh, gray area there. So uh, they, want to, they want to know that it's professional, but I'll talk about my experience uh, later on and how we engage with the clients. So this is what I do. Um, a lot of the people in the bathhouse setting, um, they are, they're basically asking this question. I don't know where I belong. So that's a fish, <laughs> if you can't tell. Uh, a fish out of water. Okay, so if you haven't been to a bathhouse or are curious about a bathhouse, um, does anybody not know what a bathhouse is? Maybe I can briefly explain. Okay, so everybody knows what a bathhouse is? You need an explanation? Okay, so a brief history bathhouse. So it has actually, um, it's been traced way back in the day when people needed to relax. Uh, and I think Martin is an anthropology expert, maybe he could shed light on this, but, or any history majors here, but basically a bathhouse is a place to relax and get clean. How it became a gay bathhouse, um, well, we needed a safe space, okay? So even back in the turn of the century or even before that, there were uh, houses or places that were secret and men congregated here to uh, bathe, but also to hook up for sex, primarily. Um, in the 60s, uh, again, at the height of the civil rights movement, a lot of the gay bathhouses were raided. And then again, in the 80s, especially here in Toronto, or the late 70s, Again, they were raided by the police. Uh, and again, because of their local bylaws, the body house laws, sex laws, um, some places weren't licensed to, um, to have sex, okay, for, for lack of a better term. So that's why they raided it. They, there was a, a clause in the bylaws. So cops came in, uh, banged on the door, 
and published the names of the men uh, who were frequenting the bathhouse. As a result, some of the people went underground. And so I'm, that's why I'm tying it to <laughs> HIV and AIDS, because the premise of the bathhouse is to have sex, yes, but it's also to have a safe space to have sex. There are men who are having sex in the parks, there's having sex in the washroom, uh, they're having sex in cars, and so because they have a, f a need to connect, all right, and I'll talk about that later on in the presentation. Um, how are we for time? Oh, okay. All right. So this is some of the people that have accessed counseling. Do you see any kind of theme? No. Well, let me tell you about bathhouse patron number one. I am a caregiver. Um, I just got my permanent resident card. I was a nurse back home. And I go back home, and you know what? I have a boyfriend there who happens to be married to a woman and has kids. So I ask, so you go there, what's your relationship like? Well, you know what? He makes me feel good. Um, he, I buy him you know, a Gucci watch, I buy him clothes, um, and sometimes I do sexual favors for him. So what are you doing here in Toronto? Um, well, I was just bored. I'm working here as a caregiver and it's my day off and uh, I'm here, just, I just wanna look at men. Are you looking for a boyfriend here? Um, no, because I, I don't like the men here. Um, and you know, what kind of men do you like? Um, I like Filipinos, and what if you can't find Filipinos? Um, I like other Asians, and have you found any? Not really. So, so this is a narrative that I've seen and heard in my counseling, and so I'm gonna talk about issues that um, this bathhouse patron may have presented. So I'm gonna go very quickly. Oh, I see the same guy, but in a different form, okay. So bathhouse patron number two. I'm a Canadian citizen. I have family here. I may have a girlfriend. Um, I may have a wife. I like to travel, especially to Dubai and Manila and in the provinces, and I like hooking up with men in the Philippines. Um, how do you identify? Do you identify anything? No, man. I, you know, body. You know, you know what it's like. Sometimes you can't get uh, sex with with the woman, so I go back home. There's plenty of cute looking guys. So, of course, because I work in sexual health, I ask about, you know, how he protects himself. Uh, you know, the HIV AIDS, that's, it doesn't affect us, okay? So that's his narrative. He seems to think that um, he, he is invincible or he's not going to be aff affected or infected by HIV AIDS or other STIs, why? Because in some uh, regions in the Philippines, I don't know how the education, uh, sexual health education system there is, or even here, if it's going through, that's why we have Asian Community Aid Services, the message is not getting through to some people. There's a disconnect. But he has this bravado that he's not going to get infected. Again, what are you looking for? He's looking for other Filipinos and other Asians um, as, as sexual partners. Okay, so here's the third patron um, narrative. He's a Canadian citizen. He's a grandfather. His wife died 10 years ago and has grown children. And right now he lives alone. He comes to the baths to hook up with men. So again, I ask what kind of men he likes hooking up with. So he likes hooking up with all kinds of men. And um, now that he's retired, he likes to explore sex his sexual boundaries. He was very loyal to his wife, um, meaning he wasn't cheating on his wife up until when she died. And then that's when he started exploring this side of his sexuality. Oh, where are we? All right, so these are the main issues. They talk about relationships, anxiety, stress. Uh, guilt and shame for being gay, for, for having sex with other men, or even looking at men. Um, a lot of loneliness and isolation. 
um, misconceptions about HIV and STI transmission or denial, and also bathhouse experience. Every, like, everybody here looks ugly, or how come everybody here is ch chasing after me, all these white men, okay. And then the addictions and mental health, which, which is a bit tricky. Some Filipinos who have access counseling, they don't have necessarily the language to express addictions or mental health. And that's been a challenge, and that's why I've embedded myself um, in, in the bathhouses. One minute, okay? So this is what I found. Migration stress, internalized homophobia, racism, acculturation pros, uh, pressures, religious and societal pressures, and gender roles and confusion. Why is it important to us? Because we need a safe space. We need to relax and f be free and escape. We need to discover our sexuality and we need to connect with others and find commonality in our communities and realize that we're all different in this diaspora that we call Philippines. Is that right? Or Filipino. And we all belong in a community somehow. All right? So that's in a nutshell. Thank you, guys. And there we are. OK. May Ferales is a PhD student in geography. Her PhD project hopes to take the research she conducted for her master's thesis, which explored the geographies of Filipino-Canadian youth's educational experiences in a new direction. This new direction includes thinking through how sexualities articulate the nexus of the gendered, classed, and racialized subjectivities of Filipino Canadians in the context of their specificities of the Philippine diaspora in Canada and the ever-evolving progressive politics. May earned her BA in geography at Simon Fraser University and her MA in geography at the University of British Columbia. Please help me welcome May Perales. Hello. Thank you. Uh, first off, I'd like to acknowledge the Anishinaabe Nation, the Mississaugas of the New Credit Nation, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron Nations, on whose traditional and ancestral lands uh, I've been learning with all of you today and will be sharing parts of my research project. Uh, for me personally, I think it's important to remember and recognize on whose lands um, we create knowledge and we share with each other on, especially given today's topic, which is central, uh, sexuality is central. Um, since the policing of gender and sexuality has been at the heart of how white settler colonialism has dispossessed and continues to disappear indigenous peoples. So for my own ancestral roots, uh, my parents are from Zambales and so are their parents. Um, they migrated, my parents migrated to Coast Salish territories in Vancouver in 1973 where I was born and raised. Um, I just gave away my age. No, I didn't, so I don't, okay. <laughs> I'd also like to take this time to thank the organizers for this incredible opportunity to be here uh, and to be able to share some of my thoughts, but also to learn from all of you. Um, what a great opportunity. My first um, experience of ever speaking and being with other queer Filipino um, academics and activists was only two months ago. And this is my second opportunity, so this is quite an, an honor and um, yeah, so thank you. Uh, I'd also like to thank my fellow, fellow panelists and the people who participated in my project. Um, and a part of that I'll share with you today. I'd also like to thank the uh, Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Salela Tooth, and Squamish nations on whose ancestral territory and unceded territory I conducted my research on. And also finally, thank you to all of you for coming out. Uh, and it is cold, people tell me it's not cold, but it is cold, so I appreciate everyone coming together. And I didn't realize there was a second tier which is making me a bit more nervous, but I'll press through. So first I'd like to start with a story. This past fall, I went to a basketball game. This game was organized by and for the Filipino community in Vancouver. The feature of the evening event was to be a basketball game starring ex-players of the, the Philippine Basketball Association and entertainers playing against local players from the community. For two hours before the game started, the crowd of about 200 people of different ages watched a lineup of singers and entertainers. The Cherry's Charity Celebrity Game um, advertised, advertised itself as a fundraiser for schools damaged by Typhoon Haiyan. 
By the time the lineup of entertainments came to a close, I still didn't have a clear sense of who or what organization organized the night's festivities. And I, up to that point, I didn't mind too much as I was having fun, and it seemed like the folks around me also didn't mind too much. But right before the actual game, after an opening prayer and the obligatory singing of the two national anthems, the presidents of the event were invited to speak and give their opening remarks. It turned out that they were the owners of a web-based pyramid scheme outfit. They invited the spectators to join a meeting the next day to learn more about the business and how to become members. It seemed that it was their vision, that it was the vision, their vision for us as overseas Filipinos to not only become members of our, ourselves, but to also and to encourage our family and friends to become members of this outfit. Because as the husband and wife team from, from California explained, by getting involved in this particular business, sooner or later, our families in the Philippines would be the ones sending us money instead of the other way around. So what is queer about this gathering? What is queer about the brown cis male bodies that gathered to play on the basketball court? More broadly, I wonder, what is queer about the safe spaces that we create for ourselves in the community as Filipinos in Canada? What bodies and narratives disappear in these spaces? And what bodies and narratives appear or come to be in these spaces? What I mean by queer is how can we see or approach such community spaces in non-normative ways? Ways attentive to the differences within these spaces but also the differences, that, the differences um, that these spaces maintain and reproduce. As I think this panel and previous panels have shown, safe spaces are inherently liberal concepts, meaning while they're safe for some bodies, they are unsafe for other bodies. Both sexuality and settler colonialism are uncomfortable conversations, but conversations with great possibilities. In this presentation, I'd like to bring these two uncomfortable conversations together by thinking about how our racialized and gendered sexualities are articulated here in Canada. To try to do this, I'd like to follow Martin Manalan San's lead, whose work with Filipino gay men in New York showed us how colonialisms haunt us in our diaspora, or as he puts it, carrying the baggage of colonial and post-colonial cultures the Filipino gay immigrant arrives in the United States not to begin a process of Americanization, but rather to continue and transform the ongoing engagement with America. Presentation, I ask the question, whoops, how are our gendered sexualities taken up, shaped by, and contoured in this context, in Canada's own nation building project as a white settler colonial and imperialist nation? To attend to this question, I work with interviews I've conducted with self-identified Filipino uh, basketball players who play regularly in different leagues in the Lower Mainland, Filipino leagues in the Lower Mainland. In their narratives, I look, to, I look for the part, how the participants talk about intimacies and intimate things in the sport of basketball. And one thing I learned is that basketball is viewed as a lifesaver. For a number of the Filipino cis males I interviewed, basketball was spoken of as, as a sort of lifesaver. Archie, a 20-year-old uh, son of a former living caregiver, shared, I remember in grade seven, we were doing this anti-drug program at the same time that kids were doing drugs. When I was growing up, basketball helped, actually helped me stay away from that kind of stuff. So basketball is bigger than anyone else thinks for me because I was surrounded with people who did that at such a young age. Archie speaks to how basketball metaphorically and perhaps even literally saved his life. Uh, other participants spoke of basketball in more visceral ways as a lifesaver. Consider 40-year-old Ray's reasons for playing basketball in a Filipino league. I think it's because it's high pace, it's competitive. They're also competitive in other sports, but you know, I like basketball most and I know I get cardio better, better circulation. See, I'm a nurse. So I understand that running, jogging, basketball are good for your heart, blood circulation, and stuff like that. That's one reason why I stay in basketball. I think that it's my first love. 
Both Archie and Ray are speaking to how basketball helps them be healthy men more than, in more ways than one. Healthy in terms of physically fit, but also healthy in terms of being morally fit men. How can we make sense of this aspiration? In the Philippines, producing morally and physically fit bodies was a primary concern of US, in, for US colonialism's work uh, to, to manage its newly conquered population. Warwick Anderson explains that the, in the American colonial project in the Philippines, the Filipino emerged in this medio moral vision as an immature, contaminating type, but also a potentially reformable one if subject to the right techniques of the body. In other words, US colonialism saw the Filipino as a physically and morally diseased race, but importantly, one that could be rescued, a race that could be rescued if corrected by Western ways of life. So this pursuit for healthy bodies and beings has a long history um, in, wow, five minutes, in the, in the colonial legacy in the Philippines, and I think one that comes to play here. Um, I think that in figuring out how these different ways of making morally and physically fit bodies can bring to light how the techniques of white settler colonialism and capitalism in Canada work and are experienced by us as Filipinos in Canada. As Shireen Razak explains, the coming of racialized migrants to Canada threatens while at the same time secures whiteness. According to Razak, in the latest and most recent chapter in Canada's dominant nationalist narrative, the racialized immigrant poses a threat to the pristine and heroic nationalist narrative of white settler glory. She explains that in, since the 1990s in this dominant narrative, the land once emptied and later populated by hardy settlers is now besieged and crowded by third world refugees and migrants who are drawn to Canada by its legendary niceness and their well-known commitment to democracy and the bounty of their land. So while in Razak's opinion, racialized immigrants pose a threat, racialized people are also taken in under the dominant narrative of white settler colonialism that naturalizes the ongoing and present day dispossession and dislocation of indigenous peoples and lands. And in order to upset this dominance, indigenous queer and feminist scholars ask us to think about the heteropatriarchal logics that are foundational to the uh, continuing violent dispossession of indigenous peoples. As Andrea Sp Smith puts it, the logics of settler colonialism and decolonization must be queered in order to properly speak to the genocidal present that not only continues to disappear indigenous peoples, but reinforces the structures of white supremacy, settler colonialism, and heteropatriarchy that affect all people. In other words, Smith and others are saying that we are all differentially involved in and impacted by settler colonial heteropatriarchy. So it's in my opinion that we need to pay attention to the ways um, that the making of healthy masculinities through basketball as lifesaver intersects with these logic that she speaks of. Because basketball is also seen as a life lesson. For Brian, staying active and being involved in the community is a lesson that he wants to pass down. And he shared, I have a three-year-old son. I want him to still see me playing when he's growing up. So I bring him to all my games and he likes it. I want to play with him, keep moving, because I never had that with my dad. And I see here in Canada, I see parents, dad, and son, they all do things together. I want to do that with my son. And Bonnie adds, for me, basketball is not just basketball. It is a life experience. When you're playing basketball, you have to make quick decisions. In the future, you realize that sometimes that will happen, and you have to make the right and proper decision. When my coach told me that, I was like, oh, wow, that's something else. And pretty much that's what he got, how, what, how he got me engaged. He taught me. He helped me to be a person. The participants I interviewed compared these life lessons of discipline to the unruly, what they characterize as the unruly styles of play in the Philippines and how Filipinos typically play, quote, unquote, undisciplined basketball. Considers Ray's thoughts here. For the most part, the ones who have stayed here longer in Canada, they play more organized basketball. They're more skilled because here they follow the rule. Because someone will tell them, you can't play like that. 
They're told, ah, you're in Canada, you're in America, you cannot do what you get away with in the Philippines. They explain how one, player, one can tell if a player has just arrived in the Philippines since he is quote unquote more physical and a, plays a less disciplined brand of basketball. After some time, however, they shared that this player learns through formal and informal structures that plas basketball played in Vancouver is less about the physicality and more about the finesse and team play, according to the men I interviewed. Brian explained that this change in play is also based on the fact that the players have to sell their labor in Canada, which requires that their, their bodies are healthy for physical labor. He spoke of a league in Abbotsford, just outside of Vancouver, where Filipinos who are temporary foreign workers play. According to Brian, they are less physical and less violent because the workers cannot hurt themselves or they might jeopardize their employability, hence their immigration status in Canada. I only have a minute left, so I'm gonna skip my, my next part, which was about the, I just wanted to conclude. Um, and what I'm trying to do with this part of my project is, sorry, okay. So what I wanted to do with this, uh, this to, by sharing this part of my th project and how I'm thinking through this part of my project is really try to think about how our bodies as Filipinos are disciplined along racial, gendered, and sexual logics. By thinking in particular in this case with how uh, forms of masculinity and sexualities are regulated um, in these intimate relationships. Right, where we play basketball. But while the making and disciplining of bodies act as one way Filipinos perform eligibility as proper citizen subjects of liberal democracy and white Canada, it's also important to remember around, uh, the racial relations around which Canada is organized. In other words, the discipline act te um, techniques I've outlined are also constituted within the rela ra racial relations of Canada that as Shireen Razak, Melinda Smith, and Sonero Tabani have put it, are organized through a complex triangulation of relations with indigenous peoples marked for physical and cultural extinction, European settlers for integration, and people of color for perpetual outsider status as immigrants or newcomers. So therefore it could be said that the discipline te techniques that bring healthy masculinities and compulsory heterosexualities into being might in w one way allow us to perform eligibility to the nation, that this performance also has its limits. As Razak and all might suggest, Filipinos as racialized immigrants and migrants are already always out are perpetually outside the nation. For Samonte, a transgendered Filipino queer activist I interviewed for my project, locating Filipinos in Canada means opening up difficult conversations around race, gender, sexuality, class, and complicity. As he puts it, there needs to be a reframing of and space to unpack the not so fun stuff and owning some of our uncomfortable conversations, owning some of our privileges, and accepting that we all have work to do and that it's not going to be easy. Thank you very much. Uh, is uh, Kim Abbas. Kim is a queer Filipino-Filipina revolutionary activist, driven with an ambitious yet hopeful dream of uniting indigenous and proletarian settlers students across Turtle Island. Kim serves as a member of the Revolutionary Student Movement, RSM, National Coordinating Committee. Kim works as one of the coordinators of the Center for Women and Trans People at the University of Toronto. Kim is currently completing a master's program in environmental studies at York University, examining how Filipina transnational activisms operate in settler colonial Canada. Please welcome Kim Abbas. Uh, ba kayo? Are you guys sleepy? Uh, why do, no? Why don't we take like, why don't we do like 30 second stretch? Yeah, let's do that. You know, just washroom while I'm talking, or if you're hungry, it's okay if you leave. Like, I'm not forcing you to stay here. I won't find it disrespectful. So, you know, we've had a long day, so. Um, yeah, so before I start, I just wanna uh, mention a few people who I feel that um, 
I'm presenting with because these are uh, a combination of conversations and work that I've done with people over the past years, but they're not speaking in the panel. Uh, I just want to say uh, hi, Will Toscano, who's here, um, who I had the privilege of working with, uh, providing hepatitis C and health literacy workshops all over Ontario. Uh, his work on harm reduction and uh, Filipino-specific uh, uh, healthcare provision, especially in health education, really uh, taught me a lot. So Hybel's right there. You guys should talk to him. He's awesome. Um, Patrick Salvani and Ray Garcia. Ray was here. But anyway, Patrick and Ray work really well with arts and culture and work so much with the uh, queer POC community. Um, they're also not speaking, but I feel that we should honor their work as well, so thank you. Um, sorry, I'm gonna, I have a list, so I need to do this. Uh, Yolen Valenzuela, who also didn't talk, but uh, also is a member of Sick Club and PwC. Um, I just feel like I also have to honor her because uh, when I was part of UKPC, all the times that she drove me home after a late night meeting, we always talk about the challenges of being queer, um, and like those conversations are really held on, you know. Um, also, Nice Rodriguez, who wrote this book. I actually haven't met her. Is she here? No, okay. Okay, well, someone lent me this book. I've never returned it, so sorry. <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, there was the story here called Stone Butch, and it was about this guerrilla fighter. Uh, it was this, like, dark humored satire, but it talked about sex and desire and death, um, and it, like, made me realize the complex, and it was so affirming to think about the complexity of... Uh, uh, queer and trans Filipinos' lives, especially as activists, guerrilla fighters, and all that. Um, so thank you, Nice. Um, and my sibling, Gabby, who's here too, because I feel that like my sibling is the one who was my first and closest ally as of being queer Filipino. Uh, I nourish all the times that we dance in front of the mirror late night while listening to Britney Spears and Sierra and like, uh, what else, Janet Jackson. And we always thought, you let me talk about girls all night, so thank you. Uh, and one more thing, I wanna thank my Lola Perla. She's not queer, but she's a freedom fighter, and I feel that it's no accident that all but one of the female-born grandchildren of hers are all gay, are all uh, queer and trans, so there's something to be said about that, so thank you, Lola. She probably doesn't even know we're queer, but yeah. Anyway, sorry, Lola. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I just want to, you know, I, I know everyone has done a, a land acknowledgments, but I also want to start that. I recognize, you know, the context of my work. I recognize Canada as a settler colony and also an imperialist nation. And so a lot of the things I've been thinking about in my activism, and now I'm back in school again, is really thinking about uh, how do queer Filipinos disrupt uh, settler colonialism. Um, so when we think about Filipinos as laborers, uh, we always talk about how uh, migration is gendered. Okay, I didn't put that there. Never mind. Okay, so we always talk about how migration is gendered. So Filipinos in the diaspora, the labor is feminized, uh, and so it's we never can really separate uh, the gender labor formations of capitalism and how our, our communities in Canada are shaped through that. Um, and so when I think about Filipinos and trans uh, queer and trans Filipinos disrupting those gender labor formations. Uh, do we disrupt it by uh, mobilizing a discourse of human rights? Are we using uh, the, you know, the language of settlement and integration? Are we mobilizing it to think about assimilation? So May uh, earlier talked about uh, the idea of safe space, right? Like we, when we talk about queer, safe space for queer and trans uh, Filipinos, uh, who is it unsafe for? Who are we trying to take out of the space when we make safe space for each other? Uh, and I also think about like, can we disrupt uh, settler colonialism by intervening with knowledge production, particularly with the understanding of ourselves through modernity. Um, and so thinking about the possibilities of Filipinos as modern subjects, are queers anti-modern, are we anti-property? Um, I found the work of, you know, now I'm back in school, I've had a privilege of work, uh, being updated with like, you know, um, the latest work, uh, understanding settler colonialism and slavery, so let's see. Um, I had to take a screenshot because she has no cover, but basically uh, I recommend, especially if you're in school, to read Tiffany King. Uh, Tiffany King is a black feminist. She worked here in the, uh, she did her master's here in Toronto, so part of her dissertation, she talked about Toronto. But basically I really found her work useful and a lot of us in 
uh, Jin's class, Jin Herbert Thorne's class, found her useful. Uh, basically, her dissertation was in the clearing, black female bodies, space, settler colonial landscapes. Uh, I, I find it really useful because she thinks about how settler colonialism and slavery, black slavery, constitutes, um, constitute each other. Right, so instead of just naming Canada as a settlement, she also names it as a settlement plantation. Um, and thinking about settlers also as settler human, right? So uh, because in the process of the clearing, which is also a noun and a verb, uh, it's, a, it's a space in which uh, the settler uh, realizes itself as a human as well. While like uh, black people, indigenous people are non-human. And, and you know, I think about how like, you know, in the process of us as labor migrants, uh, are we also being constituted in this process as non-human, uh, as someone who's just merely as laborers, but not as people who deserve to also settle? Um, let's see. Yeah, okay, so, so yeah, okay, I'm gonna get a little bit academic, may, I think, but I'll just bear through me. So uh, I also found the work of Tiffany King and Denise Ferrer de Silva, she's also, um, a black feminist. Uh, she wrote the book Global Idea of Race. Uh, she was also part of the Communist Party of Brazil, so that's really cool. Uh, but basically, she she says that um, in the in the modern time, right? So right now, uh, humans and settlers see themselves as standing on the stage of life, looking into the horizon of death, right? So um, it's it's how they it's how they imagine themselves as human. And so when you're standing on the stage of life. You have to name particular bodies as people who are closer to death, right? So I think about uh, white settlers here uh, determine black bodies as pathology, as degenerative, um, native bodies as dead, as non-existent. Um, and I think about how Filipinos are also considered, constituted as affectable. So just as workers, you know, we work because we need to live. And that's our only impulsion, the only thing that we know, is that we come to Canada because we need to survive. We have no other emotion but that. That's the only, you know, I mean, I know um, uh, Roland also talked about how like, uh, that also frames the way that we understand migration as heteronormative because we think about how all of our impulses to survive are based on our uh, human need to provide for our children or provide for our spouses, and so, how do we still replicate that same way that uh, settler colonialism and imperialism has uh, dictated how we should live, right? Um, so yeah, so that's, let's see. I'll just keep it that way. Um, and so, yeah, and so, um, and so in terms of us, you know, now that we've, we've been able to gather here, I, I'm sure this is probably the first queer Filipino academic gathering uh, I'm sure, you know, it's, it's really great to hear PJ and, and Lisa and Melania talk about it because I feel that, like, I almost forgot about that history. Again, like, if you Google it, it's not existent. But it was so refreshing to see uh, queer Filipinos coming together outside of the academia and outside of the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, I think, you know, this is uh, the amount of energy and time that they put in without getting paid, without uh, getting uh, credit for it is something worth celebrating and it's really refreshing because it makes me realize how it's still possible to or I hope so right like it's possible to still gather as queer Filipinos outside of these institutions although you know we're doing it right now um, but I hope that we still see each other after and we still you know continue those things um, and so you know I think about our efforts to come together as queer Filipinos especially through institutions um, and I think about how this is our fight towards humanization as part of, you know, also like thinking about how do we settle here pro properly, you know, how do we fight for our liberation. Uh, but it, in, through that process, who, which bodies are we putting now as pathological and as degenerative, right? Like how are we positioning ourselves as Filipinos uh, in the context of settler colonialism where native genocide is still happening? Yes, and uh, black slavery is still happening, uh, the afterlife of slavery, especially with police brutality and incarceration, uh, you know, where black and Latino and uh, native bodies are still the ones that are locked up in prisons uh, and locked up in the psychiatric institutions and are managed uh, by cops and managed by the social work and the children's aid. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, these are the questions that I, I want to think about and also want you to think about uh, as we as we really move forward with our conversations about queer, queerness and, and decolonization 
and querying decolonization. Um, yeah, and so let's see. Um, and so that's something um, uh, in uh, in the work that uh, in the work that uh, me and Hywell were doing uh, with, with Katie and doing the hepatitis C and HIV awareness workshops. Um, one thing that we were starting to introduce to the Filipino community is the idea of harm reduction. Um, and so, and then so basically we were even showing pictures of like what the syringe look like, what does the cooker look like, and then at first the Filipinas, you know, a lot of them are migrant workers. We'll be like, oh, what's that? You know, like, we don't do that, you know? And like, but later on, you know, um, we talk about how like, but Filipinos do do that, right? Like Filipinos do, are engaging in substance use, engage in sex work. Um, and so, and so I think, you know, in, in the work that we've done with the workshops, we've seen Filipinos also warm up and be receptive to the conversation. And so I think, I think they also challenge their, 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 um, their ideas that they have to feel uh, repulsed by the pictures, but because they expected the others to also feel repulsed by it. But later on, like we've, uh, it, was, it was so great to really think about um, uh, how open people are with, thing, uh, with the idea of learning about harm reduction, with learning about substance use, and uh, in, not in the framework of uh, punishing them or making them feel like they should know because uh, that's happening, that's something bad happening to the community, but really about like how um, this is an information that uh, will help us self-determine our lives, to help us empower our lives and uh, take ownership over our health. Um, yeah, and so, and so, um, in terms of Filipino youth as well, right? So anyway, I should go back. Uh, let's see. And so um, even with thinking about um, native genocide and black slavery, in terms of the community, who are the kinds of Filipinos are we also pathologizing or marking as degenerative uh, in the work that we do uh, in terms of uh, liberation and humanization? Um, you know, when I was doing uh, Filipino youth organizing, um, I would hear older Filipinos talk about Filipino youth as antisocial, uh, someone who's like, uh, yeah, engaging in antisocial behavior. Um, and I really, really had a trouble wrapping my mind around that. Um, you know, uh, as people who don't deserve to be organized, uh, as people who will like, you know, they need to get their shit together before they become youth organizers, for instance. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's really something that I had to challenge as well as an organizer. Uh, where most of my friends will fall under the category of antisocial behavior, but I see them, uh, you know, I learn so much from them. I, I see them organizing their own communities by, by cooking for themselves and organizing parties and hanging out with people, uh, which is something I wasn't even doing as a community organizer. Um, and so, like, um, I think that's also something that I've been really thinking about in terms of who do we think as deserving of organizing, who do we think is uh, a dis, uh, uh, the Filipino that we want to uh, include in our community building, uh, where in fact um, uh, most of our community members uh, fall out of the categories of normativity. You know, they're the ones who are will be deemed as like someone who's vulnerable to sex work, vulnerable to substance abuse, um, uh, not unemployed, underemployed, uh, probably didn't finish high school. And so, uh, you know, uh, when I was in high school, a lot of the Filipino queer friends that I knew didn't finish high school, right? And so like, uh, they're not in this room either, right? Um, and so thinking about, you know, and me and PJ always, we've been think, uh, talking about over lunch, is like, how do we create those spaces again where uh, we don't reassert uh, our particular Western notions of queerness and uh, ability uh, again? Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, and so, Something that I really found useful was thinking about reproductive justice. Uh, I've had a lot of, um, another shout out to uh, uh, a, a Filipino, her name's uh, Gerilyn Guevara, she's a midwife. Uh, she just turned a midwife, I mean, she just turned a midwife. She just started practicing as a midwife about two years now. She's not queer, but I feel that she's queering midwifery in Canada uh, when it's a very, very white uh, and settler uh, practice and she makes a decision to only serve non-status women uh, and also Filipinas and, and caregivers who don't have, 
who probably won't have access to midwifery and, and prenatal and postnatal care. Um, and so I think about her work and I think about all these you know, warriors who um, uh, work with our community. So reproductive justice is something I've been really thinking about. Um, and it's not just the, you know, something that will also, I feel that works for queer and trans people, not just because uh, it's, it's, it's not really just thinking about reproduction as like us reproducing each other as humans, but also how like we deserve to have safe uh, homes and uh, safe, safe homes to parents, safe homes to love, safe homes to have sex and all that, uh, and self the gender self-determination as well, um, and environmental justice. And so I feel, I think about like how in queer Filipinos, uh, the contradictions of imperialism and settler colonialism in our lives is sometimes more apparent than, than other people. Um, and I think about Jennifer Laudis' death uh, in, in the Philippines and how it was really impacting to a lot of queer and trans Filipinos here. Funny story, I will end it at that, is that I'm actually, I wasn't really out to my parents or, you know, um, but then I went to a vigil for Jennifer Laude and then like people were taking pictures and like, you know, I just held my breath and I was like, you know what, like it's going to be in the papers, it's going to be on TV and I'm just going to do this for Jennifer and like, you know, my parents saw it and, um, and I was really happy with that being my coming out um, uh, because it was also not normative compared to the Western notions of like, you know, you talk to your parents, it's like, oh, my mom called me and was like, oh, I saw you on TV. Uh, you said you were a trans revolutionary, you know, and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's my coming out. And so, you know, and my mom just accept that. Uh, so yeah, anyway, uh, I just want to say that um, um, I, I really value all the work that queer and trans people Filipinos have done. Uh, I think each one of us have always been interrupting um, the Canadian self formation, mainly because, again, like when we think about Filipinos as gendered laborers, we come, we, we, we resist that uh, because we don't fit in the demands of the labor market. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, queers as sex workers, Filipino queers, Filipino queers just tambay, uh, temporary workers, live in caregivers, guerrilla fighters, performers, artists, critical scholars, and land defenders. Um, I think we really need to think about um, how can we keep being that uh, and not just merely uh, becoming part of the Canadian settler nation again where Canada is being marketed as a safe haven for queer and trans people, much like Israel, which is also a southern colony, uh, and where 90% of, of refugees now in Canada are LGBTQ people. Um, and so how do we continue to being, being queers and, uh, queer Filipinos without uh, uh, solidifying the settler nation? Um, anyway, I'll... Uh, and to our uh, panelists, Constantine, and uh, May for talking about safe spaces for uh, LGBTQ uh, people of color, particularly Filipinos, Filipinas, whether it be on the basketball court or in the bathhouse or in the context of settler colonialism in Canada. Um, we're going to take uh, two to three questions. Um, we'll start with JP. Well, I was going to share a story of a young woman that I interviewed who is part, who is like one of two Filipinas that were playing basketball regularly in these very informal leagues. Um, and she got married. And right after she got married, she was told by the guys that she played with that she should stop playing basketball. And she wondered why. And they told her it's because it's, you can't be a mother if you're going to be jogging around and bouncing around. <laughs> And playing basketball. So I just brought to, to, to light for me at what moments do our bodies become sites of sexual reproduction, right? And what kind of sexualities and kind of heteronormative ways of family, like we were talking about earlier, really when do they matter? And uh, you know, when do they start to become um, regulated in different ways? Because they're starting leagues now for girls, Filipin Filipino girls, and they're very happy to organize leagues to, for, for uh, uh, school-age girls, high school-age Filipino girls, but as soon as you hit your 20s, um, that's taken away. Um, or it's not as popular, right? So I think these are, these are just important, I think, interruptions that we need to just slow down and think about why, why 
again, when, when do safe space, when do these spaces that we create in the community become unsafe and for what bodies? Yeah, like um, like uh, I, I think like uh, it, it's uh, you know as much as how you talked about Filipinos can also harbor uh, homophobic and transphobic uh, um, notions uh, because of colonization. Uh, I've had encounters with older Filipinos where they talk about uh, um, the you know when they start knowing about. Uh, uh, using alcohol and drugs in the community as like antisocial behaviors. Um, and I feel that like um, it's a term that uh, can be used because it's a term that like is old, right? And so like, you know, we just use it because that's how we capture the experience. Um, but at the same time, um, there's also, but then it also limits us to understand the, cap the, agen the agency, like the capacity of those youth to also um, self-determine for their lives or maybe understand why uh, people like youth drink or youth use substance use, right? Um, and I feel that like, uh, like uh, in a lot of like, like really old school Filipino organizing, uh, there is a particular Filipino youth, uh, whether you're like recruited as like a mentor for like a peer tutoring or like when you're recruited as like a, someone who gets to speak in like panels or like a youth organizer, there's a very kind of particular Filipino that is usually not queer, um, you know, uh, and very able-bodied and not deemed as like someone who's like, oh, too crazy or like disabled. Um, and I feel that like, um, it, 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 like, as I said, it's a repetition of the kind of uh, way that we think about Filipinos as able-bodied laborers already, because that's how we're recruited in Canada. And what does it, uh, and how like in, 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 the, in, the, in the context of the youth experience, we, or we don't fit that, and so why do we, and so I think we must resist uh, also using that language in terms of youth organizing, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, um, I really focus in on the performance of masculinity, right, and um, how in intimate ways 
we learn how to be masculine in kind of a Filipino Canadian context. Um, the women that I interviewed were um, self identified as women, and they, and I think that's where the that's exactly where it, the the their acceptance into playing stopped is when um, their bodies became sites for reproduction. So their bodies were um, thoroughly feminized in terms of uh, a heteronormative family. I didn't interview anyone who um, has that fluid in terms of fluidity in terms of gendered identity, uh, but I think that would be really fascinating. Yeah, to think about how also, um, I think the question was posed earlier, like how do our how are, how do our, mask, our gender identities also how do they shift from the Philippines to to coming here it would be interesting to to explore. Fritz. Yeah. Thank you, Fritz. Fritz and I went to school together. <laughs> so, yeah, as I said, what I find, and that's why I got into the mental health field, was we Filipinos, and I'm not generalizing, we seem to have not a language uh, to discuss mental health and addictions issues. Um, we s rely on our uh, family for support, primarily, and the, the, the term mental health is such a stigmatizing thing in itself, but for Filipinos, it seems to be very taboo. So that's why I got into the field. I, my, just a personal story, my, my brother was experiencing some sort of mental health issue and I, my family didn't know what to do with it. I got into social work to explore. Guess what? You know, um, I couldn't do anything about it because of self-determination, you know, until uh, the client or the person harms themselves or harms others, that's when the mental health system kicks in. So, given in the Filipino context how we don't like to talk about these um, issues, um, I got into it. So, in the bathhouse context where it's a safe space, uh, by the way, I haven't seen any trans men coming in, even, even though, well, the, the bathhouse community is very transphobic, all right? We talk about masculinity and gender roles. Um, I'm seeing them in the three uh, bathhouse patrons that presented themselves. There, it's an amalgam of personalities. It's not just one person. Um, the first bathhouse patron that I talked about um, you, you may identify this person as a bading, um, all right? So, and you know, when I, do, when I was describing their stories, it's, it's not a slight on their journey, it's just this is what I'm seeing. And it's a, I pose this to you, academics, and um, uh, those who are doing research in our people and how we can best serve them. Um, we need to listen to their stories. And this is what we're doing. We're collecting our stories. And you're right, there hasn't been enough written about our people. That's why I got into the field, because when I was doing my research, and when I was uh, doing my master's, I couldn't find a damn thing. And so, um, fortunately, you academics are continuing, Fritz, mental health, uh, continuing the, the, the work, because we, you know, curiously, we don't want to be studied as, as indigenous peoples, but yet we need to be studied in order to uh, count. And we often have to rely on other uh, research to address our individual diverse concerns. Okay, we come from uh, many islands, okay? We're influenced by many cultures, and that's, it makes us an enigma. And in the bathhouse context, we're fetishized, we're exotified, and um, so if you're a newcomer, it becomes even more uh, pressing because your identity comes into play. 
And so I don't know if I answered your question, Fritz, but it's very complex, guys. Like, it's very complex. We're just touching the, the surface. And I know Fritz is working with the elderly uh, in, his, in his research, and that's another uh, area that hasn't been explored. And we've, you know, if you follow the immigration patterns, you know, we're what, number three, number four as, as the immigrant producing country? We are too experiencing the same migration stress as other uh, immigrants. And one thing I didn't cover in my presentation is the fact that we're resilient people. But how are, how are other communities who are also resi resilient coping with these stressors in their lives? And we, we ta you talked about the youth. Okay, so the drinking and the, you know, and the other vices we've indoctrinated in our culture because of colonialism. That's how we learn to cope, right? And we've carried that forward here. And now we are Canadianized and we have other coping skills. So I think the question is, how do we integrate our culture with our colonial land here and how best to navigate the system? And I think us in the social service field who are helping other cultures in turn are helping ourselves because we get to learn how we function in this context. And um, I think um, mental health, the language, I don't know how we're going to disseminate that in our community because as, as you were saying with, with Highwell and the Hep C, how do, we, how do we address that? Like we don't have the language sometimes and in the Philippines their context is different. Here the context is different. So we're trying to find a way that makes sense to our youth, our elderly and our adults. Thank you.